The thing that's both most exciting and most fearsome is that synthetic biology, the ability to make life in a lab, is merging with certain streams of AI, and that all information now is digital. It's all like the internet. Hey, Ram, welcome back. You were just in Switzerland. You were in Zermatt. How was that? It was incredible. Zermatt, Switzerland, if For those that don't know, it's located, it's the Swiss Alps. I went for a few reasons. I went to Zermatt to see my friend Aurelia. It's her 40th birthday. She lives in Zurich. There was a festival happening in Zermatt that was focused on wellness and sustainability where she was giving a talk. So wanted to support her. She focused on radical transformation, how you really need to think about sustainability, especially from a perspective of a company. So She's a global head of sustainability at Breitling, which is pretty much everywhere in Switzerland. As soon as I got on the plane, there was Breitling ads before every movie or as soon as you turn on the TV. And as soon as you walk up the plane, Breitling, Breitling, Breitling. Zermatt is right near the Matterhorn, which is definitely a sight to see. It's just overseeing this whole town. It's this huge mountain that's looking down on this beautiful town where there's just amazing views everywhere you look. Waterfalls and clear glacial water, which is this beautiful jade color. So there's a river that's running through the town. We went hiking like every day. The festival, I like to, it was like the opposite of Burning Man. I like to think of it as like (laughs) regenerative man because it was definitely focused, a lot of it was on wellness, thinking about sustainability, which I think there might be elements of that at Burning Man. I never went. Our friend of the pod, Jocelyn Pearl went this past year, but it was great. We had amazing experiences. There was a masterclass hosted by a pastry chef from London who made, he says, peckin pie. And like, what the hell is a peckin pie? And I'm like, oh, you mean pecan? <laughs> and he's always like, yeah, that's what I said. I was like, no, because he's Italian. Yeah, it definitely reminded me of a young, vibrant Emeril Lagasse. It was a great time. It was just wonderful to be in a place where you're really close to nature. It was super clean and very efficient. A lot of things do run on solar or more regenerative fuels, which is great. It was during climate week, so we had a nod to that. I met some amazing people, too. I actually met a microbiologist. So random. She was there to support her husband. He has a mess call brand and she was there for him. How I found out, we were just chit-chatting and I was like, oh, are you going to be here tomorrow? Because it was towards the end of the day and I was going to head back. She's like, oh no, I have to go feed my baby, my microbes. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I'm like, wait, what do you mean? I'm like, what are you fermenting? Because I was thinking because of her husband has a mezcal brand, but that's like a distillation process. She's like, no, I'm a microbiologist. I have a microbiome therapeutics company. I'm like, oh, we're going to be friends all right. <laughs> all the way out here in Zermatt, we stayed at this beautiful mountain resort. It's a ashram spa resort <laughs> called wow. Cervo. It's a Cervo. Sitting there, minding my own business and see this woman just striking up a conversation and there we go. And so I told her about the Grow Everything podcast and she just looked on her phone. She's like, yep, definitely for me. She knows our friend Stephanie Kohler, our awesome. microbiome expert. So and I was like, yeah, definitely give it a listen and let's talk about what you're working on. I think her company is called Pharma Biome. So we'll have to follow up with her and see. Oh man, on. they're based in Switzerland? Yeah, they're out of ET. TH Zurich. I know them. Yeah, I know. Of course you would. It's a small world. I know them because I know one of their advisors slash investors. Yep. Yep. She said she's a co-founder. So yeah, I totally. So funny. It's a small world. Yeah, I totally know them. Okay. So what was your number one takeaway, Iram, from less than a week away? My lesson was I need to be out in nature more. I mean, it was just amazing. And the simplicity, I think, living more simply. Like, I am pretty minimal. I like to be a minimalist, as you know. Like, yeah, you are. Yeah, but even more so, I think. And we do go on lots of experiences, but hiking is just an incredible way of just thinking about life and how you live your life. So spending more time and when you travel, obviously be more conscious of traveling. You can only do so much. I'm really curious to hear about how your experience went with Climate Week, because I know you went to a climate anxiety discussion. A lot of us feel when we travel on the planes, but it's more like, I think the big takeaway is like, okay, you can travel, try to have your experiences. How do you offset your lifestyle? And how do you hold companies accountable? I did miss my husband and son because I was like, oh, they would love it here. But I think that's a big thing is just more you spend time in nature, the more you start realizing how you exist on a daily basis and what you're buying and your decisions and how do you, you know, just 
take care of the environment. Because it was actually interesting right before I left in Brooklyn, it's completely opposite. I didn't see one speck of litter in Zermatt. But in, when it came back to not. Brooklyn, it's I was Switzerland. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. You spend your time in Zurich. <laughs> yeah, I know. I did not spend any time in Zurich. In Brooklyn, unfortunately, there's trash everywhere. I was on a corner and someone was sitting in their car and they threw a plastic bottle outside of their window. Just threw it. Yeah, no. And I felt I like... I see that and I just get so upset. I got so upset. Yeah. I mean, Come getting on a bike. On. I gave him a death stare. I'm like, what the F? You know, I also was like kind of sad. I don't know if you remember this ad from the 70s or 80s. And it was like someone driving, throwing trash out the window and they drove past like a Native American. And then like the, the Native... And tier, yeah. The single teardrop <laughs> yeah that that was me i had a single teardrop when i saw that i'm like it's 2023 and you're littering god damn it i'm like what yeah like, people are the worst i'm sorry yeah. so i think that's a good takeaway yeah i mean being in nature is a huge i do it often i'm gonna do it soon so you were experiencing Climate Week in a very different environment. I went down to Washington, D.C. for the bioeconomy showcase that was put on by Symbio Beta to show off products that are produced using biotech and being shown to people from Congress. I was there with our friends at K18, who are a biotech company disguised as a hair care company, but people from Checker Spot, Twist, Zbiotics, Lanza Tech, a new company I didn't know called Inner Plant took over this small room near the halls of Congress. And the room had been like one of the places where the agriculture, Department of Agriculture meets. And there were three representatives that came, two from California and one from Indiana. And then there was a lot of lobbyists and a lot of support staff from other members of Congress. I think it was a very successful event. It would have been nicer to see a lot more people from Congress there. What I did learn was that Conagen, who was there, and Conagen produces a number of things using biotech, including mm -hmm. flavors, fragrances, nutritional supplements, Tyrrhenian purple, which is this beautiful purple that previously had been produced using a nearly extinct kind of snail. They've got a sustainable way of producing it. So Conagen had been very actively cultivating a relationship with their council person. Her name is Young Kim. She represents a part of Southern California, like south of Orange County or part of Southern Orange County. And so she was there. One of my big takeaways for anybody who's listening who has a company is it doesn't take much to cultivate a relationship with a council person. And these people want to hear about your successes. They want to understand what you're doing, especially if you're generating economic impact, hiring people in your community, because we're making a difference and they need to hear what we're doing. So that was at the beginning of the week. And then you asked me about climate anxiety. I went to a round table in Williamsburg at a restaurant bar. The name escapes me, but I went to see someone who I've known for a really long time, Britt Ray, who I'd like to get on the podcast. Britt Ray has a PhD in synthetic biology, but she has turned her attention to climate anxiety. And she wrote a book called Generation Dread. The round table was a live recording. I actually went to two live recordings last week, Iram. So it was a live recording for a podcast called Brown Queer and Vegan. And it was really interesting. The three women were giving different takes on climate anxiety and how to deal with it. I think really the big takeaway is it's something that's very real. We've talked about it several times on the podcast, but we do talk to people who are very worried about this. And I mean, right now we're living through some really wet weather again in New York City. It has not stopped raining basically since you left I since heard. like Saturday. Yeah. And it's been raining pretty hard. Today is kind of drizzly. So climate anxiety is really real. And it's just something for us to be thinking about and to doing what we can. I mean, like you said, Iram, it's like we want to be close to nature. We want to do what we can as individuals, but we also want to push companies to do better because I think a lot of solutions are going to come from what companies do. Yeah. Um, what was the other live recording you went to? Oh, on Friday, I went to the Billion Dollar Creator live podcast recording. And wow. Billion Dollar Creator is a new podcast that's being hosted by Rachel Rogers and Nathan Berry. And Nathan Berry has a company called ConvertKit, which is like an email marketing service for creators. They were interviewing Sahil Bloom, who is a well-known creator. 
I ended up talking to Rachel a little bit. Rachel has a book. I think it's called You Deserve to Be a Millionaire or something like that. She was very interesting. I talked to her because she's also an angel investor. And I was curious what she was investing in because I was thinking about some of the earlier stage companies that we work with. So it was interesting to just kind of hear them talk about how creators create value and that value is created by creating attention. And no one captures attention better than creators do. And that was really the point of the recording and podcast. A little bit outside of what we normally talk about here at Grow Everything. Thing. But it was good because we are creators and we do this for our clients. We want to know the trends and what's happening out there in the world of creation, because ultimately a lot of biotech brands are going to need that kind of service or need to understand how they capture attention of a market as they build their products. Yeah, I mean, and I wouldn't mind being a billionaire. So whatever learnings we can get from them, and if it happens, it happens, whatever. Money's and everything, but, you know, he, he does buy some stuff like influence and yeah. you know, creating change, which you can do actually without that, of course. So, but if you can learn something and it happens, so be it. Will I still be doing a podcast if I was a billionaire? Probably. But anyway. <laughs> Same here. We're providing something that no one else provides, interestingly. And I mean, for example, I'm going to give a shout out to someone who reached out to us asking us about advice on where to move in the United States. It's someone who's coming from Europe. He is in biotech. His wife is a doctor. And he was asking, should I be considering Texas, Los Angeles, Cincinnati, or St. Louis? I gave him some advice based on what I know about each city's biotech hub, but he also has an interest in sustainability. And I think that may at least to me, correct me if I'm wrong, listeners, Houston or LA more likely to be the right place for this guy and his wife. And he did mention biotech and sustainability. And to me, that seems more of a Texas or a California thing. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. We should definitely deep dive into the hubs. And why would you see Texas as being sustainable biotech? Texas has a huge biomedical establishment. It's got one of the leading cancer centers in the world, MD Anderson. Texas has, despite being very pro-fossil fuel, Texas is also probably one of the biggest solar and wind generation, wind power generation states in the country. And in fact, this past summer, part of the reason why the Texas grid didn't go down is because the amount of solar and wind that have been installed. Texas doesn't really flaunt its sustainability cred, but I do think that there's probably more going on there than we know. Solugen, which is a big synthetic biology company that produces chemicals, is also based in Houston. So I think there's a lot going on there. I have not dug deep into it. So yeah, people ask us questions and we answer them. And so that is part of the joy of doing this podcast. Yes. Yes, absolutely. As we transition into the interview, Iram, were you worried about COVID as you've traveled? Yes, I was. I do regret that I didn't bring a mask when I was flying. I totally forgot to bring it. Before it was a habit, I had it like on the hook near the door and I would just grab my key, sunglasses and my mask. But since we weren't wearing them for a long time, it completely slipped my mind. So I didn't pack it. But I think there was only like a couple people that were wearing a mask, not a lot of people. And so far, I feel fine. Actually, just before I left, we had gone to uh, a party. Someone at the party had wrote to me the next day and said that they had COVID. The protocol would be to tell everyone that you interact with when you find out that you have COVID. So I did do a test before I left because I still have some tests and I'm negative and I feel fine. So the rise is back. Do you think it's because of the weather and the changing of seasons? Like what's going on? I mean, I know you probably read a bit more about it. So there's a new variant out there, and it's definitely around. Kristen, my wife at the elementary school that she works in Brooklyn, says that there are kids out from every class who are getting COVID. She actually had the new booster. I've not had the booster. I had a flu shot. So it's out there. And I also have been masking up whenever I get on the subway, just because I'm also about to travel again. I don't want to get sick. But I mean, the whole COVID thing is very interesting because it's an example of the politicization of science during the pandemic. You had a lot of people pushing this false narrative that COVID wasn't a very serious disease, even though for us in Brooklyn, I've probably mentioned this before, we're a couple blocks from Methodist Hospital. Methodist had morgue trailers, morgue freezers outside because they didn't have any room for the bodies. This is a very serious illness, and we're very lucky that we were able to develop a vaccine as quickly as we were. And it's going on right now. I don't feel like it's as strong, this kind of doubt about COVID and 
the coming surge. But there is a lot of doubt in science. There's one of our political parties that has basically spent 40 years creating doubt in authority and creating doubt in science. And that is very dangerous. I think it's a perfect segue into our interview today with Michael Spector, who is a writer for The New Yorker, among other publications. And you saw Michael at Symbiomeda, Iram. Did you meet him there? Yeah, I didn't get a chance to meet him, but I did see him in action, not only at Symbio Beta, but also at the Ferment Conference. He is always selected to be interviewing someone at the conference related to synthetic biology and probably healthcare because he's just so knowledgeable in it. He's been speaking to people in industry. He's been speaking to people that have been affected by COVID. And I hate to say this, but on both sides of the spectrum, which there should not be a spectrum when it comes to believing in science. Oh, God, I can't believe I'm saying that. I shouldn't say that. But it, it's happening. <laughs> I feel like crazy saying that. But the whole idea of fair and balanced, it can't be fair and balanced when it comes to science. It's just science. Right. But it, he's been just really investigating it and really breaking down why people are having this doubt. And yeah, there's politics, but science is true. But the application of science hasn't been always the best. There is a bit of credibility to people's fears when there has been some malpractice, let's just say that, when it comes to population health in the past. So he kind of talks about that. I mean, he has a book that just came out as an audiobook, only an audiobook form called Higher Animals, which we'll talk about more in the podcast and so worth listening to, not only because of the content, but production value, I will say, was <laughs> very good thanks to his crew at Pushkin which is Malcolm Gladwell's production company that he's a part of as well. He'll talk about that. He was amazing, especially at Symbio Beta. He definitely is someone who takes himself seriously, but not all the time. He really just wants to get the message across. He wants to do that in a way that suits his personality, but also entertains. And at Symbio Beta, he did an amazing play. The culmination of the event ended with Michael Spector, Drew Endy, and Emmett Best, who played Jar Jar Binks in The Mandalorian. And it was incredible because it was basically a play about the future of the world. And they all did a great job. Michael Spector is not an actor, but he did an exceptional job. Emmett Best was great at encouraging them. I'm sure he helped them with some acting skills. Also, Drew Endy, is he a microbiologist? Yeah, he's a synthetic biologist, bioengineer. At MIT? No, at Stanford. At Stanford. He was at MIT previously, yeah. Oh, okay. So it was an incredible play. I do have some video of it, so maybe I can share a bit of that performance just so people can see what it was. It was great. It was so sweet. And it was like years into the future, well, I think like 200 years into the future. You'll get to hear Michael Spector. He's an incredible journalist, author, teacher, and more. Awesome. So let's start the interview with Michael Spector. Hi, Michael. Welcome to the Grow Everything podcast. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Iram and I are thrilled for this podcast. As I mentioned before we turned on the recording, our biggest concern is we have too much to talk about. Given that that's the case, I already have a prediction that we'll have you back on soon. Let's start off by just getting a sense of who is Michael Spector, walk us through your career in journalism. You're at The Post, you're at The New York Times, and now you're a contributor at The New Yorker, and you do a lot of other things. So give us a sense of what that journey has been like. Sure. I mean, I was a young journalist at the Washington Post covering train wrecks and murders. And one day I was out of the office. This is before we had cell phones. And when I called in, my editor, the Virginia editor, was screaming at me saying, we've been trying to reach you. The shuttle blew up. And I'm like, to Boston or New York? He said, the space shuttle. I said, that's too bad. I don't even know where space is located. He said, well, you're going to get Canaveral. And it turns out that the person who normally covered space for the Washington Post was, let's just say, not able to do the job. And they decided they would send a talented, aggressive, young reporter who might not know what he was doing, but would work hard not to be embarrassed. So that was the first science thing I ever did. And when I came back from that, they asked me if I wanted to write about AIDS discrimination. And in 1985, that was a very serious problem. And I did that for a while, and it was really depressing. And then they asked me if I wanted to be the national medical reporter. And I said, sure, I'm not exactly sure what a red blood cell does, but yeah, sure. 
So in those days, there was a little more money. So they gave me some time to go around and talk to smart people and learn things like what a red blood cell was, or at least who to call when I had questions like that. So I covered nothing but AIDS for at least a year, and then it branched out into other medicine. And I eventually became the New York beer chief and left the post and went overseas for the New York Times. But I had done a lot of things and covered a lot of issues from wars to abortion and the things that I always wanted to come back to was science. It just seems sort of limitless in a way that other beats weren't. So even when I was living in Russia, I wrote a lot about the healthcare system. And then when I moved to Italy, I did a little of that. And then right after I moved to Italy, the New Yorker got a new editor who happened to be an old colleague of mine from the Post, David Remnick. It's exactly 25 years ago. So he said, come back. And I said, I can't come back. It wouldn't be fair. My wife were divorced. She was half Italian and she had lived through five years of Russia. So she wasn't going to be happy about moving back to New York. He said, okay, fine. It doesn't really matter where you live. So I lived in Italy and worked for the New Yorker. And then that was a dot-com boom. I spent a lot of time as a room person does in Silicon Valley. Then we eventually moved back the week before September 11th. I mostly have covered science since then. I, for a while, was doing a fashion profile every year because, well, it started out as me doing a favor to someone. And then I found that given my beat was viruses, poverty, and death, it was nice to spend a couple of weeks in Paris or Milan writing about ladies' clothes every year. So I did that. I mean, just not about the clothes, but I profiled some famous people. But mostly since then, it's been science, genetics. I got very interested in CRISPR and synthetic biology. I wrote a book called Denialism that came out in 2009. And the last chapter was about this weird thing called synthetic biology. And I don't think there had been a lot of mainstream pieces about synthetic biology at that point. I was just fascinated because it just seemed well, like it does now and like some form of AI does now, it seemed like science fiction that was actually not fiction. It promised a lot of good things. And it also, unfortunately, like all this stuff, the bottom line of all this stuff is as biology becomes more digital than anything else. That's fantastic. I did this audio book. I don't think people appreciate the miraculous nature of the mRNA vaccines. But when you can do that, when you can download the sequence of any virus from the internet, turn them into viruses, infect cells, you can make a vaccine really quickly. That's what happened. And it was wonderful. You don't have to have a huge imagination to see that you could do some bad things with that. So that's what we're dealing with now. And it's what something that I care about. I'm not one of these, let's shut the world down, folks. I am aware that we need better regulation of synthetic biology, and I'm acutely aware of what's going on. My AI focus is more on biology, and I've been working on the story on that for a while, but it's sort of a general truth. I think the AI stuff is wildly hyped for the moment. By that, I mean it's not going to change our lives as fundamentally as you think right away, but I do feel pretty strongly that it will eventually. If you look at AlphaFold, the thing that DeepMind did to solve protein folding, which I will say I've been working on a piece for a long time about. That is amazing. This is a problem that seemed insolvable, that took 50 years of the best minds, that cost $100,000 to characterize a protein, and they can do it in a minute. They're usually as accurate as any experimental method. And you've already seen endless uses of this thing. And I think it's just the first salvo in what's going to be a very exciting revolution in medicine. That's sort of me, soup to nuts. Wow, that's incredible. You are the perfect person to have on this podcast. You touched on a lot of things that we talk about here as well. And it sounds like your introduction to reporting on science and technology was through assignments. And then you got really interested. But was there a specific moment that sparked your interest in synthetic biology in particular? I cannot remember how I got onto it, to be honest. But in the reporting, I went up to MIT and interviewed a guy who would become a very close friend of mine, but whom I had never met, called Drew Endy. 
his description of synthetic biology to me was revelatory. I mean, we ended up teaching bioengineering together at Stanford eventually. I mean, we've been good friends ever since, but I just couldn't believe the stuff he was telling me. And I remember at one point in our first interview, he said, I have to ask you to leave because Homeland Security is coming in half hour. I said, why? He said, they're asking the same questions you are. So that was in the middle of Drew's move from MIT to Stanford. I was totally meaningless aside. I was supposed to go windsurf with him in Oregon in August of 2008. I had a really bad accident the day before. So that never happened, but I got better. And I spent a lot of time with him out at Stanford where he had just moved. But I can't tell you what sparked my interest. It may have been a paper I saw, but I've written a lot about genetically engineered products in my life. I've been an incredibly aggressive believer that those things are, by and large, great. You can misuse things, and people do. You can overhype things, and people do. But the hatred around GMOs has, I think, pretty much always been a hatred, a somewhat misplaced hatred of the companies that own more seeds than they should. Though that isn't even really true when you look at it. And Monsanto doesn't have any monopoly on seeds, and it never did. To me, the idea that you could engineer seeds to beat off the poisons, make it so you wouldn't have to use lots of insecticide, keep the things that eat your corn away, and have it be healthy, non-toxic, use less water. This just seemed magical. Golden rice, for instance. And the idea that people objected and still object to it, it blows my mind. What is golden rice? It's a genetically modified variety of rice containing large amounts of the orange or red plant pigment beta carotene. Yes, the same stuff in carrots. This substance is important for the human diet as a precursor of vitamin A. We need vitamin A for good vision and eye health, for a strong immune system, and for healthy skin and mucous membranes. Yummy. So that was the beginning of this. I'm a big enemy of the word natural. I hate it. Simply because I don't know what it means. I once saw an ad in New York City for natural rat poison. Is that better than synthetic? Will it kill you in a more loving way? I mean, they're all marketing terms. To me, the ability of science to solve some of the very big problems that exist, and to be honest, some of them exist because of the way humans have acted, is very exciting. And we have that ability, and we should stop getting in our own way so much. So I guess that's another long-winded way of saying, I think probably I got to synthetic biology through GMOs, just by seeing how you can, in the lab, alter the essential essence of a plant or anything else to change its characteristics. Yeah, I've always found it to be magical as well. And Drew is a great resource, great person, very inspirational. And I want to talk about denialism, but I want to save that for a little bit because I want to talk about what you just said about the magic of synthetic biology. And for this latest book, the audio book, which you narrate, which Iram and I have been talking a lot about since we both listened to it, I highly recommend that our listeners give it to someone who doesn't know anything about synthetic biology. You said that the coolest interview you did was (laughs) with the black-footed ferret. Yeah. And I was hoping you could maybe tell our listeners about this because we just recently interviewed Ben Novak from Revive and Restore. Yeah, and, I talked to him and just slid for that. Yeah, and I think I said it in one of our recent interviews. I was thrilled because after we had published it and I had publicized it on Twitter, Stuart Brand liked and retweeted the post, which is a big deal for me since I'm a huge Stuart Brand fan. But I'm hoping that maybe you could tell our listeners about why that ferret and the use of synthetic biology to restore this extinct species is so important from your point of view. By the way, on the Stuart front, I don't get that nervous when I write things, but I was anxious how those guys would respond to the whole chapter on Revive and Restore in my book. And Stuart really liked it. I've known Stuart a long time, and his respect is something that matters to me. So I was very happy. The Blackfooted Fair, the reason I was excited to do it is, I mean, I did this as an audio book for a couple of reasons. One is I thought there were some individual aspects of it that wouldn't really translate into being typed out. In one chapter, there's a hearing that happened in the early days of molecular biology that I think listening to what went on in that hearing is very valuable. But you also can't really get a black-footed ferret to talk to you very much on paper. So why do I care? 
Well, black-footed ferrets are the most endangered species in the United States, and they're endangered in an interesting way. They eat prairie dogs. That's their whole entire menu. They would eat nothing but prairie dogs if they could. That used to be fine before we started developing the West and doing all the things we've done to the ground and started killing prairie dogs by the tens of thousands. It's now harder for them. Another problem has come up. Prairie dogs and black-footed ferrets are susceptible to something called sylvatic plague, which is an animal version of the black plague, and it kills a lot of them. Now, there's a vaccine that prevents that, but you can't run around six states in the West vaccinating every ferret. It's just hopeless. What you could do, and I actually think the original idea for this came from Kevin Esfel at MIT, who I actually teach with now, but I could be wrong about that, but I think his original idea was, we have a vaccine. Why don't we splice it into the genes? Why don't we use CRISPR to deliver it into the germ cells of a ferret so that when it's born, when it's cloned, when it's created, all the cells will pass on basically the vaccinated resistance that you would have if you got a vaccine, and that way you would make it impervious. So that's what Revive and Restore have worked on that for some time. I always thought it was cool. I wanted to go out to see these ferrets, but it's difficult to see them. But I couldn't go because it was during the pandemic. And they have respiratory systems that are not so dissimilar from ours. And they got COVID too. So they were as locked down as we were. But I did get to do a very entertaining Zoom tour with the folks who take care of them. There's this one ferret, Elizabeth Ann, that had been cloned. Her mother, or sister to be more technical, died 40 years ago. But the San Diego Zoo kept the DNA. They cloned it. And we were seeing a new kind of ferret, one that could actually protect itself from very deadly things. So the reason this excited me so much is that there are a lot of ecological problems, many of which are a result of things humans have done to the environment that we can address using the tools of biotechnology. I'm not one of these GMOs and biotech is going to solve every problem. It definitely won't. But we need all the solutions that we can use. And science offers some really good solutions for things like that. I was very excited to see it go along. And it was also, I'm a journalist. It's not a hard story to tell people about the Black-Footed Ferret. It's been made infinitely easier since COVID because people are like, what about the vaccine? People understand to some degree what the COVID vaccine is, or they understand that it's made in a way that other vaccines aren't. That's an important lesson. And that's sort of why I did this as an audiobook only, as an experiment, because I don't think a lot of regular people are going to sit down and spend 10 hours reading any book that has the word synthetic biology on the cover. And I couldn't really figure out a way to like skip those words in a book about that. But I think a bunch of people will listen to four or five hours on a car ride or while they're cooking or something. And I'm trying to get students, people who are interested, just to get engaged. I really have heard from a bunch of people who, after listening to it, were like, wow, this is kind of cool and also scary. None of this future science stuff is going to work at all if just people in labs deal with it, which is what's been happening for the last 200 years. These technologies are too powerful, and we need society to make some decisions. I say this all the time, but the fact that I can go online and you can tell me, any of you can name a virus right now, and I can give you the sequence in probably less than 30 seconds. That's crazy. I used to not mind if you hunted, you would see that I wrote a pretty big defense of Ron Fouché when he manipulated the bird flu virus to a point where it was contagious. Because it seemed to me at the time, if you could figure that out, then you could figure out a good vaccine. I think that was possibly true at the time. Another thing that was true, this is 10-ish years ago, not a lot of people could order DNA on the internet, make it, they couldn't afford it, they didn't understand it. But we're living in this very parallel world to when, after World War II, a computer took up a giant building. Now the computer in my Apple phone is probably more powerful than the one that sent the first men to the moon. We're seeing that in biology. Computer processing is getting cheaper. Synthetic DNA is falling. 
price. People are understanding how to use it. And all of that, I think, is fantastic. Can you imagine a world where we didn't have the computing power we now have? But it brings real risks and it needs participation. I want people to start thinking about this and it's hard. It's hard to get people to think about it. I'm still struggling to get people to pay a little money to prevent the next pandemic. And by a little money, just test the wastewater everywhere. It's 10 billion bucks a year. We lost $17 trillion in this pandemic and we can't get Congress or anyone to spend $10 billion a year. I'm going to tell you this, and it's going to sound like whining. I teach a course called Safeguarding the Future with Kevin Esfeld at MIT. I know my source of funding didn't get cut off this year, but it got cut by a third. That's okay for me. I can live with that. But I'm just wondering why you're cutting money from teaching people about pandemic preventiveness, how to deal with existential risks, what to think about AI and biology when they're put together. That's just not where I would go to cut funding. I have mixed feelings about this. It seems like the Defense Department is starting to get it. And that's because a lot of people, and this isn't wrong, are pushing all this stuff as a national security issue. The Defense Department has so much money that they can spend 10 billion bucks and it's like me buying you guys coffee. If that's the way it has to be, I would rather it be other ways, but that's probably for another one of our conversations. At this point, I just want to have the ability to see what new viruses are coming, which ones are growing exponentially, so that we can do the magical thing, which is make a vaccine. The Moderna's vaccine was made in about four days. The basic vaccine was ready in about four days. I mean, there's a lot of testing that has to go on, but we can change this stuff out really rapidly now. We need to be, in order to do that, we need to know where the threat is. As you can tell, I'm annoyed about all of that. You bring up really, really good points. I think something that Carl and I always talk about is we, like you, believe and see that biotechnology is providing several solutions to not using chemistry that can provide toxic chemicals and cause more climate damage. But then we don't necessarily spend enough time talking about the risks of biotechnology. I think right now in Washington, of course, they had the meeting regarding AI regulation. When are they going to have the meeting about biotech regulation and have that same fanfare? Like every news outlet's talking about this meeting with all like Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg are there. When are they going to have that? I know they had something like that, but it went under the radar. They had that bioeconomy meeting yeah, last year. Them, but I was talking to a very, very important person in the AI world the other day about this. And he and I agree. It's pretty easy to get people hopped up and scared about AI. They're all worried that they're going to lose their jobs and AI is going to take over the universe. And this is because every book or movie that you see about AI does one of two things. Either AI vanquishes humanity and subjugates it, or somehow humanity prevails like Ian Banks, if you're into science fiction, created the culture series. And those are books where AI and humans and other species flourish together. It's not a one or the other thing, but that's a pretty rare exception. And I think the general view in people's mind is AI is going to take over. And you know, it's not stupid to worry about the power of AI. It's just we have a lot of time to plan for it and to affect what happens. I don't want to see people get so hopped up about AI that they don't realize that they're out there working on meaningful treatments for Alzheimer's and cancer and autoimmune disease, you know, really powerful things that AI can do that will help humanity. So a lot of this is a result of people like me. Science journalists are good and some of them are great, but we tend to hype things and you read a lot of things about this is going to destroy the world. When the AI frenzy started, everyone was like, well, no one will have to work anymore and we'll all have universal income. And I don't politically know how that's going to happen. It may be that at a certain point, we won't need to do the things that we do. But as long as humans are human, they're going to want to get up in the morning and do something that's meaningful to them. Whether you call that work or something else, I don't know. But I don't think we want a world where we have no purpose. I don't think we will ever have. Yeah, I mean, right now, the world is saturated with information and misinformation. So what advice would you give to aspiring science journalists or writers who want to communicate effectively and responsibly about scientific topics? 
I think the most important thing you can do, and this is hard because like I work at the New Yorker and they give me lots of time and I can talk to whomever I want, but try to talk to smart people. It's not that hard to figure out who the experts in a field are. You don't have to talk to everyone, but you can talk to some. And how is it not hard? You can do Google searches and see who pops up. Some of those people will not be valuable, but a lot will be. And you can look at PDFs online and can see how often studies are cited. You can get a basic sense for the people who are valuable. And then you have to just talk to enough people to get a sense of what matters. Don't make it all about the great thing or the horrible thing. Like this famous sort of local TV thing is if it bleeds, it leads. That's sort of universally true in journalism. You're going to get more clicks with crazy out there things. But that isn't what we want. And I should just stress there's a ton of great science writing out there, more than there ever has been before. I think it's probably harder to make a living doing it than it has been at other times. I teach two courses at MIT, and one is I teach a writing course to these graduate science writing students, and they're great. I mean, they are great. They want to do the right thing. They are pursuing the right thing, and it's really very inspiring. The main reason I teach is because it's kind of exciting to be around these kids. I agree. It is exciting to see new voices emerge when it comes to science writing. And I mean, that is our business here at Messaging Lab, but doing it for companies. I want to shift the talk a little bit and talk about science denialism because you wrote about this. I think the book was published in 2009. So you must have been writing this in the 2000s, which at this point is seems like a long time ago. The book was about people's irrational fear of science. We saw a lot of that during the pandemic. We're starting to see it again because there is a could be a surge. We don't know yet. There's a new variant that people are getting sick from, and there's a new booster that people are denying is going to do any good. You've probably seen this explode exponentially, science denialism. And I'm curious, what's your take on it now? Is it the same around the world as it is in the U.S., or is it just worse here? It's worse everywhere. At the time that I did that book, I did a TED Talk. A couple of years ago, TED called me and asked if I would go on the radio hour to update, see how things are going. And Guy Raz was like, are you happy with the impact of the book? I'm like, well, it helped feed my family, but I can't really argue that it's done anything at all in terms of persuading anyone. The world is just worse when it comes to all the things that I care about than it was 15 years ago. There's more denial. There's more willingness to believe sources that are untrue. Bobby Kennedy, a guy I wrote about in that book and wrote the most damning things that a human could write. He's running for president. And by the way, I did an audio book on Fauci. I was happy with it. And I did a profile for the New York Times. I've known Fauci forever. He did a book on Fauci, just a bunch of lies. It sold zillions of copies. I'm not whining about like, why aren't my sales better? But where does the world come to the point where a book about a guy, you can say what you ever want about Tony, like everyone else, he makes errors. He's been a public servant his whole life. He spent 50 years getting up at five in the morning and spending his whole day just trying to make people healthier. I lived through the AIDS epidemic with that guy. And what he did was remarkable. He's just a dedicated public servant. Who the hell would go to medical school and then want to be a public health servant after seeing this? I find it heartbreaking. I mean, Tony will be fine. But for our country, it's remarkable. I was at the dog park the other day and someone was talking about shingles and asked me if I had shingles. I said, no, I did this crazy thing called get the shingles vaccine. They asked about it. I said, well, I actually had three. I got one about eight or nine years ago that was okay. And then Shingrix came along probably about five or so years ago. And that's an infinitely better vaccine. So I got two doses of that. The person is like, what's the big deal? I said, well, ask around. If you've ever talked to someone who's had shingles, it's very painful. Usually people get better, but not always. Oh, have you had it? I had it last month. It was so insane. You're too young probably to have the vaccine recommended. Right. And I'm glad you know that because the doctor in front of me, Google searched at what age someone needs to get vaccinated because when I asked her, she didn't know off the top of her head. But they said also because since I was younger, like I didn't have super debilitating, although it did some damage to my hand. But still, it's no joke. 
I think the it's, recommendation is probably 50 and old. It is yes. 50. But the thing is, why 50 year old? I have a friend who's in his late 50s who got it. And as he was really miserable. And you don't want to say, you stupid asshole, because he's miserable. But what is it that there's a beautiful, and then they'll say, well, there are ribs. How do I know I'm not going to get sick from the vaccine? And I have always gone through this. So it's like, you don't. Biology isn't 100%. But the risks are relatively minimal. Probably one in a million people who get that shot will have a really bad reaction. But if you vaccinate 10 million people and you don't vaccinate 10 million, that 10 million who aren't vaccinated are going to suffer widely, whereas the 10 million who are vaccinated are going to feel like they got punched in the arm for the most part for a day or two. This is just one of the biggest no-brainers in human history. And yet I'm at a dog park trying to convince someone that she should get it. And I finally said, look, I've kind of given up on this stuff. I hope you don't get it, but you probably will get it if you don't get vaccinated and you'll regret it. And then they start the COVID thing. I did a piece when I was teaching at Stanford the last year I taught there was the first year of the pandemic. And I only teach in the wintertime. So in June of 2020, I drove home to Hudson, New York, where I live from Palo Alto. And I did a piece on that trip for the New Yorker kind of diary. And this was before there was a vaccine. I'm healthy, but I'm not super young. And the idea of getting the tube shoved down my throat didn't really appeal to me. So I was hypervigilant. I would go into places and they would see my mask and they would think I just came down from Mars. Utah, Arizona, all those places. About when I got to Pennsylvania, I started to recognize people who wore masks and didn't think I was a nutcase for doing so. I remember I got back to Hudson and everyone was wearing masks and I felt so happy to be home. But how the hell that became a live free or die thing, a right wing or left wing thing? It's just very sad. These are scientific decisions. And again, we made some mistakes. Like at the beginning of the pandemic, I wish more people had said COVID vaccines are unbelievably effective. You get COVID vaccines, and unless you have other serious illnesses, you're not going to die, and you're almost certainly never going to go to the hospital. It doesn't mean you won't get sick, but it'll be mild. Instead, I think it was pushed as a, you have the vaccine and now you're fine. And a lot of people then got sick, including me. A lot of them who don't know much are like, you're liars. You told us we'd be fine. And these vaccines are super effective at preventing serious illness, which is what we want to prevent. Yeah, one of the things that has blown me away about the pandemic, one is you talk about it in the book about people who want 100% certainty when it comes to new technologies. So it's just impossible. Right. But then the other part of it that blew me away and continues to blow me away about the COVID vaccine is the highly educated, and I've got some of these in my family, doctors who choose to deny that an mRNA vaccine can be effective because because they believe that it's in there changing your genome. They do not want to understand the way the technology works. I've had the fortune, I think you interviewed Phil Dormitzer of, yeah. of Exxon Partners. We worked with the Novartis vaccines for many years, and so I got to know a lot of the people on that team. And so I really understood the way that vaccine development had evolved over the last 20 years. And when I would tell, I'm thinking of one physician in my family in particular about it, he just was in complete denial. There's no way you can put something on the market that quickly. There's no way it can be safe. Everything you're saying is basically a lie. So I'm curious, what's your take on that? What was the point where that started and why has it gotten worse? I think this is a very fundamental problem that started a long time ago. And I'll give you my completely unscientific personal view of why this is happening. A hundred years ago, wherever you were in a room, if you were working or making dinner, all the things around you, you probably would have made them or someone you know would have made them or you would have known how they work. You know, I call my kid. She lives in L.A. I know the phone call bumps off a satellite in geosynchronous orbit and goes 38,000 miles. But I don't necessarily know the physics of how my phone gets into a little teeny piece of titanium 4,000 miles away. 
I'm pretty sure people don't. And I'm okay with that. And I think most people are okay with just like getting Netflix at night and not worrying about how that happens. It's just that when you add all the things that happen in our life, it leads people to feel like they're not in control of anything that's going on. They don't understand what's going on. A lot of this has to do with very poor education. I have for many years said, I wish people would stop teaching physics in high school and instead teach statistics. People always say, what is the chance of something happening to me? Or they'll say, do I have a chance of getting sick from this? And I'm like, well, you do have a chance. But the question is, is it like a one in 10 chance or is it a one in 47 million chance? Because that's what matters. People don't do the numerator and the denominator. They just want one number. So I feel like people actually feel like life is getting out of their personal purview. And I think we've seen that with a lot of technology. I think social media has in many ways been a disaster because it's misused. I mean, Twitter is a very valuable thing for me as someone who likes to keep on top of what's going on in synthetic biology and also in AI now, or at least the AI that involves biology. It's a very efficient way of doing that. And there haven't been lots of deep fakes and lies in bio Twitter. But everywhere else, it's crazy and the venom and it's difficult. Somebody very, very, very smart said to me, we were talking about AI, and he said, you know, when it came to social media, people planned a little bit for failure, like what would happen if this didn't work or that didn't work, or we had to shut this off or that. Nobody planned for success. Nobody sat down and said, what's it going to be like if 7 billion people have access to this? I like YouTube. I know the people who run it. There's 500 hours of YouTube videos uploaded in the world every minute of every day, always. Now, you just can't police that. So you have to make some decisions about what you want to do, how you want to regulate things. And I don't think we've been able to get our hands around that. So the answer tends to be a lot of cynicism. And then let's also be honest, corporations lie, politicians lie. There are reasons not to believe authority. Usually, I'm good with authority. But right now, you look at Congress, and there are, I think, elected officials in the United States who think witches and goblins exist. It's hard to take an elected body seriously in the 21st century when members think that. So I think this is a very broad problem. And one of the symptoms is when a guy in a white coat comes out and says, take this shot and you'll be fine. They're like, how do you know? Show me. You know, they don't understand the data. They don't want to understand the data. I have found with measles vaccines and moms, I used to be quite arrogant about it and dismissive. And my views have always been, this is for you and your babies. I mean, don't be an idiot. But over the years, I realized that doesn't really help. And those people are just legitimately afraid of something new. I've had a lot of success with just talking to mothers and talking to pediatricians, answering their questions, and in the end saying, if you're going to roll the dice, this is infinitely safer than not getting vaccinated. It's like 100 million to one. And you want to be on that side. It doesn't mean it will take all your worries away. And it doesn't mean you could have no problem. So it's a learning process for politicians and journalists. Younger people are better about this. Like when I went to Sinbio Beta, that crew was very impressive. But older people, they basically think, I'm a brilliant scientist. I work really hard. That's my job. Leave me alone. Someone else can do this other stuff. What I say is it doesn't work that way anymore. You're not going to get a grant anymore. You don't have to walk down the street and explain how the spike protein works to every person on your block. But people ought to have a sense of what you're working on. In case you were wondering, spike proteins are what you see when you think of an image of coronaviruses and see spikes covering the virus's outer membrane. Those are specifically called spike glycoproteins, and they facilitate the virus's entry into healthy cells, which is the first step in infection. And I always feel like if a group is working on something important, at least one member of that group ought to be pretty eloquent about saying what they're trying to achieve. And I think that is younger, and by younger I mean 50 and younger, 
people are getting that, but I'm older than that. And I think my generation that's like should be thrown away. And hopefully you'll all still be here when we're gone. But you know, <laughs> it's a tough learning curve. I won't lie. What I do is a little frustrating because I've been doing it a long time. I love learning the stuff I learn. I love the students seeing how cool it is. I think we're making a lot of progress. But then I hear people like Bobby Kennedy say, well, you know, the COVID vaccine was engineered to protect Chinese people and Ashkenazi Jews. I mean, why not? And maybe people with like brown hair or a good 26 foot jump shot. I mean, it would be so insane. It would be easy to dismiss, except a lot of people don't dismiss it. I wish we valued science in the way that we used to value science. I think we take it for granted a little bit now. You look at an iPhone or any phone, the stuff that goes into it, it's crazy all the technological achievements in one piece of equipment. The fact that I don't know where any of you are, if you're in the same place or not, you could be in this country or another country, but we can communicate. I mean, I don't mind this. I got really sick of teaching on Zoom because it's not the reason I got into teaching, but it is a valuable thing to be able to communicate across the world. I just wish people would appreciate it and support it. Science education, that's like a whole education side. But when it comes to denialism, it seems like it boils down to trust. Like, who are you yeah. trusting? But in the higher animals, in the audiobook, which is a great audiobook, I love the way it was produced. So shout out to yeah, Pushkin and all your all your peeps yeah, over there. But good. this wasn't always the case. Back in the day, when the smallpox vaccine, people were lining up. They were ready. There were people that yeah. there's vaccine places in police stations and other locations. What are, and I, people should listen to the book, but just for a highlight, what what happened where this denialism became so rampant? Like what happened over the years? Well, look, in 1947, I go into this in the audiobook, but a guy brought smallpox to New York and it was a really busy time, a time when you couldn't ask for a more combustible mix of virus and population density and people moving around on subways, but they figured it out pretty rapidly. They tested and then vaccinated 7 million people in two weeks. I think I wrote it down. I think two people died and maybe 13 got sick in the city of New York. It could have been millions. It could have been millions. One of the things is after World War II, people trusted science. They trusted authority. It had won the war, radar, antibiotics, all sorts of vaccinations. These things were quite apparently extending your life. People who were born in 1900, their life expectancy was something like 46 years old. People born, like I was born in 1955, I'm 68, and my life expectancy, according to actuarial tables, is probably another 22 or 23 years. That's a giant leap forward in a very short period of time. But people have had reason not to trust authority. And I really do feel that they've been lied to a lot. And then things have happened like AIDS, where you saw the government just didn't give a shit because it was gay people. And eventually that sort of changed. But we live in such a fractured society. Minorities are just taken advantage of and not given a fair shake. And a lot of the people, I mean, I'm not a political person, but why did so many people vote for Donald Trump? They didn't have anything else. You know, I lived in Russia and I saw what happened when socialism went away. It was great if you were young and entrepreneurial and you could start a business. But if you were 55 and you had spent your whole life working in a factory, being sent on your annual vacation, having hospitals paid for, and then suddenly you didn't have any of that. It was brutal. And I think in a lot of this country, that's what's happened. There's just an enormous amount of frustrated people out there We've gotten to a point where they just don't believe anything the government says. And it's really sad and painful, and it's going to hurt us. This is going to sound stupid, and I know you know what I mean, but in many ways, we were lucky with COVID. It wasn't that bad a virus. It's bad, and it's complicated. But if it had been something like H5N1 with the same characteristics, tens, hundreds of millions of people would be dead. And we can do something about it, and we're really not doing nearly enough. And then when you go to SynBioBeta, that thing you mentioned, that sort of expo of synthetic biology, it's crazy all the stuff that's going on and what people are able to do, what they're on the breach of. 
I wrote about ginkgo bioworks in my audiobook, and I don't own any of their stock, but I am a big fan of theirs because I think they're doing it right. They have the right idea. And one of the reasons I like what they do is they do understand that security matters, that biosecurity is important, and we have to educate people to both at the same time. We have to tell them why it will be really cool if we could figure out a way to make energy that doesn't destroy the world, but also that we need to have some rules. It's a tough time. I will be optimistic because I think so much is going on in science that's exciting. I can't help but be optimistic. But it's a little depressing when you see some of the things people say and do. Plus the fact that people believe them. Yeah, I will just say this about vaccines. A lot of the Republican elected officials who are so anti-vaccine, they're all vaccinated. Ron DeSantis did not get a vaccine. These people are vaccinated. Donald Trump was vaccinated. He had monoclonal antibodies or probably would have died. Why these people think they can take advantage of the cutting edge science that this country produces and then tell the people who believe in them that it's wrong to do so is crazy. And it's also, I don't understand how people cannot see, like, why are you doing that? Why are you doing it but telling me to do something else? That's where we are. Yeah. Michael, I want to be super conscious of our time because we did schedule an hour. So I was hoping I could get one more question in. And then if there's anything you wanted to add that we didn't cover. But what are you working on now? Are you planning on writing another book, doing another audio book like this one? I've been working on something for a while on biology and AI. That's for The New Yorker. Hopefully that will be out soon-ish. It's not a piece that's like, if you look at AI stuff every day, there's new things that can read Japanese, it can solve this problem. Some of those things are cool and will be valuable, but a lot of it is just crazy hype. But the biology is real. There aren't many vaccine researchers or cancer researchers who are not working with something like AlphaFold, this ability to see how proteins fold and how they might fit in to a therapeutic regime, a vaccination regime, a drug regime. So I'm doing that and I'm thinking about, maybe I'll write a book on that. I'm not sure I will. I don't think my next book will be an audio book only because I don't want it to be as technical as maybe this one was. And this one was really entertaining as an audio book. I think I'll probably revert to the write a book and then do an audio version. Maybe I'll write a book and not just read the book, but if I can get Pushkin on board, make it a little bit more exciting than just reading it. Can we make a documentary? Well, it depends what on Netflix. Yeah, that that is something is talked about. So yeah, that's what I'm working on. And teaching actually is important to me too. I enjoy it. And I I kind of feel like at this point in my life, if I can get five people to focus on something or change their mind or go in a positive direction, like, yay, it's fine. I'll take it. That's great. Mike, before we close out, is there anything that we didn't cover? I mean, we've got so much to talk about and we would definitely want to have you back. But was there anything that we should have covered today that we didn't? The only thing I think we spoke around a bit, but the thing that's both most exciting and most fearsome is that synthetic biology, the ability to make life in a lab, is merging with certain streams of AI and that all information now is digital. It's all like the Internet. I've gone to see some structural biologists recently. It's like going to Wall Street. Everyone's working on a computer. Eventually, you have to infect some cells to see if things work. But it's mostly lab work now, and that it's mostly bits and bytes. I think that is cool, because if we can understand information, we can rewrite some of the big problems that exist. And I think that's what's the most exciting thing that's going on. I think that's a positive, upbeat note to end this interview on. Thank you so much, Michael. We're really looking forward to having you come back. Yeah, I'd love to be back. Okay, Ram, what do you think of that interview? Michael Spector is incredible. I just really found that his audiobook was a good place for a lot of people to learn about how science can help populations, how it could be misinterpreted, how it can be politicized. And he does a great job of looking at the facts and not trying to rile people up and just take one side. I think for us, we are scientists and we're just like, how could there be another way? How can there be another opposition to science? But there 
there is. And we can't just write off people that think that way, but we need to figure out a way to understand why they're so reluctant and try to educate, also try to bring them to a side of reason. But yeah, we understand why you might not want to get the vaccine or why you're hesitant why you might not take COVID seriously. And that's understandable. But this is the data, right? Like, you know, we saved all these lives. If we didn't have the vaccine, this is how many people that would have died. And right. taking lessons from history, taking lessons from the smallpox vaccine, which, you know, smallpox is a horrible disease. Everyone signed up to get vaccinated because they wanted to. They want to make sure that they survived. And I think a lot of that is our job, Carl, and the job of people like Michael Spector to communicate clearly how the science is important and what's going on. So People don't see science as something that's abstract because it can get really deep. And how do you make it easily understandable? And I think that's the job of a lot of science communication. I mean, not just for scientists and people in our job, but even for journalists, teachers that aren't science teachers. But like, how do they ensure that people can think critically, can understand that, OK, yes, there's DNA in our cells and it's, this is how it works. OK, I get it. I get it. And so I can make a better decision when it comes to my health and how I live every day. Yeah, I had been taught a long time ago that vaccines were the cheapest way to protect a population. And then I ended up doing work for several years for what was Novartis Vaccines and Diagnostics and really learned about the state of the art of vaccine development. So when the pandemic came along and everyone knew there was going to be a pandemic, there's typically a pandemic every hundred years without fail. So people expected it. So when the pandemic happened and the vaccines that ended up being developed were developed really very quickly. And yes, they used a new technology, which was mRNA technology for these vaccines, which Michael Spector goes into great detail in higher animals. You know, yes, it was new technology, but it was really built on 20 years of research and development. What people forget is that at the beginning of 2021, there were 100 vaccines that were being tested. And we were lucky enough that two of them were effective and were on the market and available by third quarter, say September, August, September, October of 2021. So it took a while. Yeah, they developed the vaccine very quickly in a couple of weeks, but it took a while to test it. And yeah, there were 100 other vaccine candidates, but only two ended up being the ones that were effective enough. Mm -hmm. So you can be cynical about it. You can say the technology is unproven, but it turns out that now that we've given millions of doses of these vaccines to people, they've proven overwhelmingly safe. And as Michael commented, millions of people's lives were saved. And if they did get sick, their illness was much less severe than had they not been vaccinated. So I think it's very hard because people are afraid of the future. They're afraid of technologies they don't understand. There's big forces out there who are trying to undermine science and technology. And one of the things I always remember as well is that after the Second World War, the United States made a very concerted effort to invest in research and development. I think even up to 5% of our GDP was being spent on that. We don't do that anymore. We barely spend 1% of our GDP and it's always being questioned as to whether we should continue to spend that money. And yet that money is well spent. All the technology that we take for granted every day, not even counting the healthcare technology, all comes from basic research. And China has taken that playbook and applied it to its own economy, investing between 3 and 5% of its GDP in science and education. So it's one of those things that I think we always need to be pushing hard on because those investments pay off. I love that Michael also teaches at Stanford and MIT. We've had several people on the podcast, Natalie Cludell of BioBuilder and Linnea Fletcher of Innovate Bio, who are both educators. And I think we do have a kind of a education sub-theme that goes on through this podcast because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is get people to understand that biotech isn't just healthcare, it's growing everything so that we can create a more sustainable and just world. One thing that I thought that was really interesting was Michael's comment on the digitization of biotech. What do you think about that, Iram? I think that's what's really enabling a lot of advances in healthcare and coming up with unique products because you can do some simulations, you can do some modeling, you can find unique enzymes and peptides just through leveraging digitization of data and AI to create these things so that when you go to the lab, you have a head start. You don't have to spend so much time trying to figure things out. I think that has been like a theme throughout a lot of our podcasts. Uh, it's how the leaders in biotech that we bring on this podcast, how they're 
leveraging software and technology. We had Eduardo Abilek of Tesla Gen come on talking about how he's just digitizing the whole process, the end to end, thinking about how to create different biotech products, being able to sync everything together, whether it's design, building the actual biotech, maybe the experiment that needs to happen in order to make the bio product and how to test it and how to learn from it. So he does a whole DBTL process through a platform that he created. So that's a unique application of biotech. But the digitization of biology in terms of how do you digitize that so you can write biology just like you can write code because DNA is a code of life. We had Andrew Hessel talk about that a bit with his company, GP Write. So I think that digitization is incredible, but from all the people that we've talked to, it is very, very hard just to take something from a digital write-up and get it working in the real world. It is, can be very challenging, but what about you, Carl? Yeah, and it's interesting because like there was this news, but the Zuckerberg Chan Institute, which is the philanthropic efforts by Mark Zuckerberg, one of the things they're working on is digital models of cells. So mm. what people may not understand is that cells are incredibly complex. We don't even know how many processes are going on at any given time within a cell. The machinery of a cell is reading DNA, it's producing proteins, it's moving food in, it's moving waste out, it's growing, it's dividing. All of these things are happening simultaneously. And we still don't have any accurate models of what that looks like because it is incredibly complex. So the fact that Chan Zuckerberg or Zuckerberg Chan is working on that, I think is going to be really useful for disease modeling and could be something that helps accelerate disease treatments and disease prevention. So it's very exciting to see how digitization and the applications of artificial intelligence to biotech are already changing the way things are practiced. And I know we're going to see a lot more of it. It's something we should save for a future episode. Is there anything else that we should have covered before we call it a pod? No, I mean, it's been really exciting. Since I was away in Switzerland, I didn't get to really hang out with our biotech, climate tech crew in New York for Climate Week. So I really want to catch up with people besides you. This is actually our first time really chit-chatting since I got back right on the pod. I'm really curious to see what results came from it. I know the SOSV Climate Virtual Tech Summit's happening now, so I'm going to hop on that after this. Stay tuned to our podcast. We're always bringing on incredible guests. Next, we'll be having Vishal Bouyan. He's going to come on and talk about Annika Biosciences and food safety, which everyone needs to be aware of what's going on there because we eat food every day. So great episodes coming up. Stay tuned for that. All right. So I'll close it out. We have a hotline. If you've got any questions or comments, any recommendations of guests we should interview, please text or call us. The number is in the show notes. You could save it in your contacts under Grow Everything Hotline in Texas whenever you have a hot, deep thought or news story or comment or something that you want us to talk about on the pod. And if there's nothing else, that's the pod. See you later. See ya.